crew now. Look at that. Yeah. It's 37, right? We're not late, are we? No. No, it's 6.30. She just 6.54'd us, so you're good. Hi. Hi. Change sides. Hey, we got to mix it well, up sometimes. Well, sometimes you have to change sides. You might become a jack of it. Okay, I know. Carolyn put my name here, so I, or somebody did, so I sat here okay. tonight instead of over there. That's how you not have any I know, you can sit wherever you want. You can go rogue. You can do whatever you want. That's his. <laughs> oh, no, I have a name tag. Oh. oh. I guess we can just go. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Oh, look at this. Ooh. Should we rat for gift? <laughs> Sorry, it's very casual. Like that. <laughs> Political? Well, yeah. uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, now a little just just about seven we're gonna open up the, the public hearing for the Northampton planning um, today's planning board um, every planning board usually starts with a public comment period for people who want to speak to some item or issue that's not on the agenda if you do want to speak to something on the agenda we'll certainly take that when those items open up so if you have any public comments please come up with the then ordinance, we requested a buffer at the 2016 site plan hearing, but we're told there was no need to buffer the well-kept grounds of the former Clark School. Though not on the plan, check writers south side has subsequently become the repository for multiple HVAC units to include a large noise compressor and an enormous and very loud generator scheduled to run for an hour each month. The parking area remains, though now fronted by neon yellow concrete barriers. And pickleball courts, open to the west side's employees and tenants, and perhaps to those in the east, will soon join this motley, unattractive, and noisy collection. Given the typical size of the development's new plantings, the promise of surrounding shrubbery rings fairly hollow. Yes, we recognize that a developer's plans can change as work progresses. However, the view from our northeast window, door, and yard <coughs> is no longer a well-kept grounds. <coughs> we need relief. And relief in such bait-and-switch situations should be city policy. At a historical commission meeting prior to the site plan hearing, I asked Mr. Douglas about a buffer. He shook his head, uttered a drawn out no, but added that extending the fence would be possible. I responded that more fencing might violate historic <coughs> district standards, my error. Since then, no more has been said. However, the existing fence was shortened after a dramatic 2018 gas line rupture, <coughs> thus enlarging our view of the, the, of the development's utilitarian south. Since moving to Round Hill, we have planted approximately a total 25 arborvitae fir trees and rhododendrons along our northern property line, thus shielding our view of the old Clark generator and more. Lestead's plantings continue to the street but several trees are stunted by the developers dying hemlock and black birch that overhang our property. Given the extensive revision of the developers' plans, at this point we need visual and oral relief. Extending the existing fence eastward to the large lamp pole would be helpful. Though I'm hardly a fan, a row of tall, robust <coughs> arborvitae would be both more effective and aesthetically pleasing. Though it shouldn't be necessary, we are willing to contribute to their purchase. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to comment at this time about any other items? So, Carolyn, do we have any steps to be taken with the developer upon? I thought 
if I remember this hearing correctly, there were going to be plantings along the south side of that pickleball court yeah. and, uh, yeah. and the uh, utilities. <coughs> yeah. yep. So they just haven't happened yet? or Right, because the permit was issued, I think, in the early fall. Right. And then, right. So they weren't planning to do it till I think, springtime. Okay. So that all won't, the landscaping won't be completed until then. Okay. Spring. So that's part of it, Mrs. Gross. I understand that. I still think a, maybe eight or ten Harbor Vitae, remember it is up from us, we are down, we see the whole, everything, would be extremely helpful. Okay. And as I said, we are willing to contribute to the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, if there's no one else who wants to make a public comment, we'll uh, open up our discussion. So the first one we'll take <laughs> is a discussion of committee assignments and the chair and the vice chair. Carolyn sent around a little flyer about the, the committee assignments. You can't put that up for us, could you? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, so I left yeah. mine at home. Yes, I can put that yeah. on the screen. Um, let's just see. Um, sorry. I thought I had it open here, but um, let me grab it. Um, oh, God, I have my mouse. That's what that's for. <laughs> so, <laughs> does anyone currently have a committee assignment? No. 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 Okay. You, you and too early. I'm new your here. Your tenure, right? I'm new here. So I'm I'm serving on the CPC as the planning board rep. <clears throat> I think that's about the only one. I guess the people who left Mark and Tess had assignments okay, to zoom this. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Get you again. Yeah. So we've ha also had some changes. So um, there have been some changes to the committees and committee structures. Um, so the list I sent you is um, some of it was uh, had us already been deleted there's one on um, I, I, I we can start at the top um, I th um, so the first committee is capital improvements which um, is not meeting now that's really to develop the capital to help develop the capital program for the city each year um, so um, that they start meeting in September and it's a citywide thing it's not just planning projects but you're sitting on a committee that's representative of the city and of different sort of interests for funding for the city um, Mark Sullivan had sat on that committee for a long time so that spot is vacant um, and uh, if I might, I served on that for a while, and it's a series of meetings as the budget's being developed, and so um, department chairs, department directors come in and present their pitch for whatever capital improvements they might want, Right. and you can have a back and forth with them, and then the committee kind of goes through the, the, their budgetary requests and kind of d debates on them and then recommends things to the mayor, I believe. Yep, that's right. Um, Does that mean that it means once a week for, between September and November? Is that what that notation means? Um, yes. So, um, <clears throat> and it, I think it's, um, I'm not sh sure how consistent that is from year to year. And um, I think they start out, um, it's more spread out. And then as sort of things get refined. So there's a, typically a series of meetings with departments to hear from each department what their capital needs are. So as it gets sort of into the heat of it, they're definitely more regular. Sometimes they're a couple times a week. Um, but then, you know, it's finished by November. Um, so how, should I run through these and then we can then go through and discuss? Okay. So then we also have um, a technical review um, that happens for projects um, that are in the pipeline, in development. So 
Um, we offer a sit down with any applicant that's got to come for public hearing to either planning board or zoning board or conservation commission. Usually it's the bigger projects that are coming to planning board. And um, we sit down and we meaning um, our office and I direct um, the committee that um, is, um, has a staff person from the Department of Public Works the building department, um, um, the housing planner, usually if it involves housing, conservation commission um, planner, um, economic development coordinator from the mayor's office, and one planning board member, um, and if necessary, a zoning board member, depending on the nature of the project, <coughs> or if necessary, a member from the Central Business Architecture Committee. So it just depends on the project where it's located. Um, the fire department, do they come? Or yes, they and, uh, and the fire chief <coughs> or deputy fire chief um, usually comes. Um, and actually, a couple people from Department of Public Works related to stormwater and then other utilities. So the idea is that the, the staff sits down <coughs> with one member of the <coughs> boards to take a look at the um, proposed concept plan and give feedback to the applicant. Um, projects don't always come to fruition um, after that, but it's a way to make sure that the applicant is on target with um, making sure they're hitting all the requirements in all the different areas and codes of the city. And um, so it helps to um, ensure sort of fewer delays when it comes to public hearing um, and that the application is ready once it's submitted. I mean, it's not it's always a guarantee, but um, that's part of our process to make sure that the public doesn't have to come to multiple meetings and the board doesn't have to hear, you know, go to um, have public, multiple public hearings because an applicant's not ready. So that's what that is. It, you, it meets as needed, but um, the third, right now we're on a schedule of the third Tuesday and it's sort of before um, typical business hours. So we only look at a uh, maximum of two projects per meeting um, or as necessary. Sometimes there's only one to review and we give the, um, it's, it's basically the maximum of 30 minutes per project. So we start at 7.30 if there are two. 7.30 to 8 is the first one. 8 to 8.30 is the second one done by 8.30 in the morning. Um, if we only have one, I either do it at 7.30 or start it at 8 for that one. Um, both, so Both of those committees are a great way to meet people around the city. If, yeah. if that interests you, you know, to kind of network with people in other departments. And, um. and typically so that we don't have a problem with um, any kind of quorum, only one person, only one board member um, can come, but we want to make sure there's a backup because not everybody can make every single 7.30 or 8 a.m. meeting. Um, so it's good to have two people um, lined up for that. Um, formally, we had um, a tra we had someone representing uh, uh, as a representative on the transportation um, parking and transportation committee, but because of the um, administrative reorganization of that committee within the city that the mayor has um, finished sort of um, doing, we're not going to have a member of the planning board sitting on that committee anymore. Um, the Wayne, or as the director of the planning office, would sit on that um, committee. So that that's why that's a strike through there. Um, and that also included the bicycle pedestrian subcommittee. Um, we also have. So and Alan was unceremoniously yeah. dumped from that committee. Feel awful. It was yeah. ceremonious. There was a ceremony. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> um, I'm trying to cope with it. <laughs> oh, Alan, we had fun on that committee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so then the next one is Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So typically it's the chair of the planning board um, has been sitting on that, but it also has varied depending on whose interest there is. And unfortunately, um, they tend to meet on the same meeting nights as planning board. So it can be difficult to 
straddle both of those. I think, um, obviously, Tess was most recently the representative. Um, I know Deb and Bruce sat on it for a while, and she would sort of try to figure out which meetings made sense to go to, you know, planning board or PVPC. Sometimes it starts earlier in the evening right. so you can get back from PVPC. Sometimes the meeting's in Northampton or Holyoke, so it's not going all the way to Springfield. So there's that. And it's really um, just p to sort of participate in that regional conversation. I think, George, you sat on yep. that too, yep, right? Yeah, for quite so. a few years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> <laughs> it is it was a really interesting committee because you get to hear about the regional things you get to hear about the tip the transportation priority projects that are happening um you get to meet a lot of other planning kind of personnel from the other cities in the pioneer valley which is great too and i think i mean the key of course is um understanding that and particularly as it relates to transportation funding or other state funds that can be used for infrastructure. Um, right now, we have a lot of projects in Northampton that are, um, you know, backing up, getting ready to go for the ne over the next year, year and a half. So it's not just the Exit 19 <coughs> project, but um, there's the Hatfield North King Street roundabout. There's um, the King. <coughs> Um, and Finn Street yep. signal, <coughs> state and Finn signal, the um, off ramp at, at Edwards Square, and changes to the intersection of North Street and King. Um, and so there are a lot of transportation, pro and then of course Main Street is, you know, very early in that TIP process, but that's one of the projects that will go through the TIP. So participating in that conversation and understanding sort of where we are in Northampton in terms of planning for those, um, strategically for those transportation improvements um, and being able to advocate for those to the region to say, yes, you know, we're ready to go because th those are the projects that get funded. Um, so it's definitely an important, you know, position. Um, and then we have the Community Preservation Committee, which George, you currently and, and our buddy over there was on it for quite how many years? Where, did you serve I on? on it? I was an elected, so it was four years. Four yeah. years. Yeah. I don't know if you're staying on or not. Uh, no. So that's what I'd like to talk about. So if you're not staying on, I will say it's a fantastic committee. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, whether either whether either way, I didn't want to. Get people's hopes up if you were planning to yeah. stay. But no, I think it's open. It's, I've served yeah. on the CPC, you know, in its early iterations, too. I've really had a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. And it is a fantastic committee. Nobody comes in and complains about anything. <laughs> it's all. It's the opposite of NIMBYism. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that you have, because <clears throat> it's composed of people from all bunch of different committees, you have a lot of expertise from all different realms of, of the city. It's pretty amazing. And it's not as, I mean, this says first and third Wednesday of the month, but that's not regular or consistent. It depends on the funding yes. rounds. So there's a break um, in between funding rounds. So when there's not a funding round, <coughs> then you're not meeting at it's all. It's September so, to December and then like January to, or February to May-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Summer's so, off. Yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that it's not on this list is we used to have a representative on the housing partnership. Um, and we decided, I think, Alan, you were the most recent rep to the housing partnership, decided that maybe it wasn't um, uh, the best way to have communication go back and forth between the planning board and planning office and the um, housing partnership. So um, we stopped, we started having internal discussions more with staff between um, the community development office and our office. Now <coughs> we've just merged those two departments back into the planning office. So we're doing community development as well, which includes housing. So we're going to be staffing internally from our office. We're going to be staffing the housing partnership again. Um, so um, we're still trying to figure out what might make sense. And it might mean that it just is sort of stat like internal conversations between staff, the staff person who will be staffing the housing partnership and then 
me right now yeah. as the planning board yeah. staff person. Um, but I'll keep you posted on yeah. that as we work through that. So I, I would put a plug into participation. I, I served on that one for a couple of years too when I first started. I had a lot of energy back then. <laughs> and uh, I learned a ton about affordable housing. And because that's such a big issue for our city, yeah. I think it's really good to have somebody on the planning board who's, you know, um, understands those conversations or hears that come. Certainly yeah. we get a lot from you, Carol, and I'm not diminishing that, but I think it's for anybody who's interested in that issue, it's really some great conversations that happen there. And I know this woman, Peg Keller, who's resigning, certainly helped to drive those conversations and was a well <coughs> And, and the other thing I'll say about that is we're trying to sort of re um, uh, work with the housing partnership to figure out what makes sense for their role, even in participating with the planning board on issues, so that it's not they're not a separate sort of advocacy group working in their own silo, but that you know um, a, we're trying to figure out the best way to integrate the, those advocacy. Um, efforts into the planning board's um, work and also you know public forums on on housing and things like that so um, that's um, what the next couple of months will be about sort of on the administrative side is if figuring out that that role so we'll keep you posted about that um, and I just put then at the bottom of this I just put um, just sort of an update of other planning <coughs> projects because um, I think the last time we reviewed committees <coughs> and we're talking about laying out sort of the planning long-range planning projects that we were going to be embarking on over the next two years or so um, I didn't even put the uh, municipal uh, vulnerability and and um, um, work on here but I think at that time the board had voted to um, try to set aside meetings during the um, year to focus on those as opposed to creating a subcommittee that just focuses on those long-range planning projects. So, um, I mean, you know, tonight's an example. We'll talk a little bit later about um, where we are on the two-family housing by right. Um, so similar to that sort of analogous to that is sort of how we might treat these other planning projects and sort of have, you know, one meeting dedicated every other month or something to those bigger planning projects. Um, so if you want to continue to do that as opposed to have a subcommittee, that's absolutely fine. But I just put those up there just so we sort of revisit that conversation. And so that's it. So how do we want to move forward on committee assignments, ask for self-nominations, <laughs> people who are interested in serving who feel like they have the, the extra time to go to these meetings. The CPC is twice a month, so there is a little bit of extra work there. Mm -hmm. um, that's for sure. The, uh, the PVPC. Did you say that was not all year long? <clears throat> right. It's um, so basically September to December and funding available then this um you know the next round would be early spring through may like maybe february or so through i may. think they'd, they're having their first meeting next week for this round <laughs> but it's a very light round so the, it's, it's the same number of meetings no matter yeah. how much money you have to give out yeah. though, yeah. So. Yeah. um there's generally about i think it's like seven or eight meetings in the round you sort of there's, you get applications. There's there's small grants which are under like two thousand dollars, which you can, which I mean Northampton has come up with their own rules on how to allocate CPC money or CPA funds. Um, so that you got uh, you get applications which are pre vetted by Sarah, uh, um, who's a staff member. Uh, so they're all Sarah like legal. LaValle? Sarah yes. Lavalley, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, you don't see applications that are not. Um, that that it would be illegal to give CPA right, they haven't been to. vetted before yeah uh, there's a pre vetting yeah. process uh, and then you write questions for the applicant and then they come in and present and answer questions and then there's a pub there's a usually one or two depending on how many applications there's one or two meetings where the public comes and comments and that's where you get this sort of kumbaya 
sessions. I think in my experience, there was only one time when somebody came and spoke against an application, and it was actually the, the in a sense, it was the applicants coming and speaking against their own application. It was <laughs> interesting. But, uh, uh, oh, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, they had to edit it with their members first, kind of. Um, and then there's some discussion, but I would really stress the um, high level of the discussion in that group is, I mean, just really thoughtful and uh, informed. So it's five or six, seven meetings, depending on the year. Um, but a lot. I, I'd oh, give okay. that a try. I'd do that. Okay. Anyone else that wants we could have? I would like to, um, because I left the CPC because my time is, is pretty tight. Um, when you say that the uh, PVPC meetings may uh, also be at the same time as this, yeah. that's uh, appealing to me, actually. Okay. So, <laughs> it's a way to get more involved and maybe not actually uh, allocate any more of my time. I so, see. I that see. That's not the only reason. I find yeah. the, the, uh, yep. Anyone else would like to throw their hat in the ring for either of those positions? We could have a voting runoff. It doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So that's two out of four, um, the CPC and the PVPC. Um, Just to clarify, though, these current planning projects are not covered by these committees. These are TBD right. how they will be covered. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. So I put them there just uh, to check in to see if you still want to move forward on doing sort of a committee of the whole discussion of these versus mm -hmm. having a specific subcommittee to, to work see. on. Them. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's where we can actually do planning as opposed to just kind of permitting kind of reviews. It's, it's really a, a nice to be able to look down the road towards things too yeah. and help shape some of the plans in the city. So anybody interested in this Monday morning technical review? Where are you guys? Tuesday. 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 <laughs> Only it could be earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say it's definitely as permits come as applications come forward. So it's not necessarily even once a month. I don't think we've had one for a couple of months yep. now. So um that's also an irregular one. But what happens is I notify whoever's on the list. I, it's a, um, a week ahead of time that I notify people. So. I work seven to four, so some of the stuff's off the table. Okay. I'm working retail, but not exactly very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to do that unless someone else wants to step forward. And maybe Sam could be our alternate. Stuff, Sam could be our alternate, who's not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I know he has young children at home too, and he has a, yeah. the construction uh, sites, I think, open up pretty early for him. <clears throat> so the capital improvements thing, if I volunteer for it now, there's nothing until September. Right. <laughs> Seems magnanimous. <laughs> quit in September. Yeah. Yeah, I'm out. Aren't you moving to Arizona in August? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm in. Uh, I I would do that. Good. That's it. I'll let George come tell my wife. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> just just so we, uh, just for my own ed edification. So. This, this makes a recommendation to the mayor, and then in the budget there's always like this long list of priority projects. How different is that from what gets recommended, or is it usually just passing through, or? Well, um, it depends. So the, the, the capital plan is a five-year plan. <coughs> so some things might get pushed to year two, oh, okay. and then you come back. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the mayor takes the recommendations, you mm -hmm. know, Seriously, it's, right. a, it's a little bit like the CPC, and sometimes there's a lot of talk about bonding things, really big items, and right. uh, you know, move forward. That, and I think the uh, who's the who's the CEO, the CFO of the city, Susan Wright. Yeah. Susan, so she yeah. kind of facilitates the meeting. Right. She, yeah. So, and then she provides sort of wh what the funding mechanisms could be for you know each one of those or how you know what pots of money can be allocated for hmm. okie doke um, I would say as far as the like the long-range plan when if we want to circle back to after 
this conversation. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I'd hope to be able to talk about as part of this. And I mean, if it can be baked into the agenda so yeah. that we all get to participate, I mean, that yeah. seems more without dedicating additional uh, time. Because the other thing it seems like to me is like you have a subcommittee and you talk about it and we're still going to have to right. bring it back here for right. a larger discussion anyway. So. Right. <clears throat> yeah, and that's totally, I mean, that works for us, certainly, <clears throat> on a staff level, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that still is something that um, is of interest to everyone. Yeah. So ideally, we go through a period of time where there's a, a, a lightening of the permits. Right. And we can have one permit on Thursday night, and then half of the meeting can be on one of these plans. Right. right. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you, Um and if if the conversation around the housing partnership comes up again and there's a ch it would be great to bring that back here and talk about a little bit if there is a place for a board yep. member to because that i think is a meeting just once a month housing partnership or they meet twice no once once a month yeah. yeah in all honesty the housing partnership the um <coughs> had a, peg had a really hard time every month coming up with an agenda I mean, it seemed like there was nothing to do. That's, that's my honest opinion. She just couldn't think of things to put on the agenda. I mean, now, I mean, you saw in the paper this week that um, the PVPC just sort of finished this housing, um, mm. you know, needs assessment essentially for the for the city. And so there's a, there are a lot of recommendations spelled out in that. So there's a lot of work that the partnership did over the last... I don't know, six months to a year with PVPC on that. And now I th there are a number of recommendations within that that I think they're going to be interested in gearing up to try to figure out a means to um, address those or help facilitate, you know, um, <coughs> ways that the city can um, achieve some of those objectives. Was that report the HUD required report? Um, because on TPC a couple of years, yeah. I remember being sort of right yep. after the election, uh, it came up the funding for this HUD required report to get, I think it was to get CBD funds. Yeah, so we, so there is a, well, there's an, um, an annual and then five year plan right. also for housing. This is a little bit. But this feeds into that because it's sort of, it's an, oh, it's a, sort of taking a step back and looking at the needs of the city partic in particular mm -hmm. and then helps shape those plan the HUD required planning mm -hmm. process. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, on your right in that this partnership doesn't have any kind of decision making gusto, right. you know, as opposed to the Conservation Commission, even a historic right. commission. So mm -hmm. they're really it's a different kind of advocacy. I, I would say though, I mean I don't know if anyone saw in the news about what happened in Amherst maybe it was a week ago where they put an RFP out for a school Yep. to do affordable housing and I think Valley CDC put forward a plan and they just said no yeah. I mean it's, I think that kind of intangible coordination between people on the money side on the planning side on the housing side is sort of it's hard to exactly know where the fruits of it are but it shows up when you don't have projects just like die right <laughs> which I think Northampton has a you know I think that communication is really useful but I think it's true. It's hard to understand exactly what you're doing <laughs> in a committee like that. So now before we move into two family based um, form based code, we want to think about uh, a, a chair and a vice chair moving forward. Um, and you know, I, I, when uh, Mark and Tess left, I um, kind of stepped into this role. Um, there wasn't a lot of Machiavellian backroom cigar smoke kind of manipulation. It was just because I had a bunch of experience from 10 years ago. So um, I was welcome to do it for a while, but it doesn't mean I need to do it going forward. I just want to kind of say that up front. So how do we want to open this up? What's been the tradition of having chairs and vice chairs? I mean, um, uh, typically, 
I don't recall it ever being in the back room, but <laughs> I was gonna say, has it always been I'm waiting for the Machiavellian uh, That's a good part. action, yeah. Okay. Right? <laughs> Where is the back room? <laughs> um I think you know, if uh, people have an inkling to uh, and an interest to do either one of those, um um they've typically come forward. I'll tell you that um you know, the official way to do it is to have someone nominate that person once the, it's clear who has an interest to do that, and then we do a roll call vote. Um, I, for people who haven't been in the position before, I am certainly available to provide, um, you know, staff technical assistance ahead of the meeting, so um, don't feel like any of you would be thrown into sort of um, the the wild without any um, um, support about uh, for this and for each project so um, and what are the responsibilities of the, of the, besides running the meetings like what else is involved um, <coughs> typically that's the biggest function is is um, running the meetings making sure the you know proper um, voting procedures are, are followed um, there may be times where the board says there might be a condition where um, the applicant has to come in and um, review something with the chair and staff or something like that. So on occasion, there might be other opportunities for the chair to um, to um, conduct business outside of the meeting. Um, you know, you're the point person for the board, so um, you might get called from by the press um, to answer or respond to something. Um, but and then you just say, "Call Carolyn." <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> you respond in the way you think is most appropriate. Call Carolyn. Call Carolyn. That's been so. a big change because that used to have a reporter here every night for hearings. <clears throat> yep, every night. But uh, as we've seen, the Gazette gets slimmer and slimmer, and the reporters don't show up. Yeah. Well, I think George has been doing a great job. I agree. Second, yeah, appreciate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. okay. If it's appropriate, <laughs> <laughs> I'll nominate George. I would second that. Okay, so who should I put that down? Krista or Helen? <laughs> Krista. Okay. Get your name in the news. <laughs> it's all I've, I've been in the news so much this week. Make sure you add who seconded, please. Mm. Now, is there like a procedure for impeachment of the <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I have to go to the Senate. Oh. Exactly. State Senate. Yeah. It's definitely going to in involve somebody getting up and talking for three days straight. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to start on this end for the vote. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Aye. Okay. Yep. Ellen. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you're abstaining. Okay. I think so. Uh, <laughs> I'm in favor of myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Reconsider if you won't. <laughs> Thank you, folks. So is the vice chair just the backup to the <coughs> Basically. position? Basically, yeah. yeah. And traditionally, I think it's a two-year limit. Is there a term limit? You, this comes up every two years? Um, I two. think we <coughs> review it every year, but I don't think there's a term limit. Okay, yet. so yep. the, the vice chair is kind of being groomed for the being the chair, perhaps? <laughs> or bride, <laughs> I'm not sure what's the word. <laughs> In training? <coughs> Not that that should scare anybody from being a vice chair who doesn't want to come up to be. Who doesn't want to be groomed. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if um, George isn't available, then the and the uh, hopefully the vice chair would be. Then the vice chair would run the meetings. Um, and yeah, that's basically. Are we allowed to nominate Sam in absentia? <laughs> <laughs> I I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would be very nice of us to do. Who has the longevity here? No. 
Okay, you're ready? Yeah. Okay. You've been on for a while. A while. Yeah. I bet you could run a good meeting. Run from a good meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the good meetings you don't run from. <laughs> I can't tell if he wants somebody to second that. I know. I mean, I'm going to get a phone call in the morning, good or bad. <coughs> I'll exactly. second the nomination. He can always decline. I guess as long as you're doing everything. <laughs> um, the enthusiasm is overwhelming. <laughs> also humble. Okay. Okay, so... <laughs> I'll jump right into ro roll call requests so we can. <laughs> yes, I guess. Okay. Alan? Following George's precedent, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right, we're official now. We did the same problem at CPC. It took us like an hour to get a, to convince someone to be a vice <laughs> chair. <laughs> Brian's been the chair for 10 years? No, he was, just, he came in when I came in four years later. Yeah. And he was on the committee, but I don't think he ah, was. Okay. Well, thanks for managing that so quickly, the first item. Now we have the more exciting stuff. <laughs> we could do the minutes first, if okay. you want. Sure. <laughs> the, is there, a, a, folks hopefully got a chance to review the minutes that Carolyn sent to us. Is there a, we have two sets of minutes. We'll take them one at a time. Actually, uh, they put a third one in. Oh, from third. November. Which, what date is that? Uh, November yeah. 14th. And just so you know, for the, um, those who weren't on the, you're voting to accept the minutes in as the official record. So it doesn't, it's okay if you weren't at the meeting oh. or you weren't even on the board then to accept them. Can we do them all together? Yeah. Sure, unless you had any changes. There's nothing wrong with. You know. I'll move we accept all three. All three right? the, the minutes of 11 14, 12 13, and January 9th. Okay. Second. All right. Second. Any discussion? Any edits? We're all good. All right, all those in favor? Yeah. Uh, opposed? Unanimous. Great. And we don't have any ARs, just these. Ah. Okay, let me get this. Two families. I'm dying to know why you've joined us tonight. Are you interested in two family housing? No. I'm just getting a lay of the land for a future meeting. Great. Where I will have something to say. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome. Yeah. Gee, there's somebody who prepares. It's admirable. Okay, so um, let me just pull up this document. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to put this on the screen. Uh, so I sent, um, so um, we've had a consultant helping us through the summer and um, fall on developing uh, design criteria to move forward with a zoning modification to allow two family by right throughout the entire city, even in the districts that currently are single family only. Um, based on sort of built or building on the um, over two decades of experience of having accessory dwellings allowed by right in all of those districts. <coughs> so this would be sort of a, a little bit of a step um, uh, beyond um, single family with accessory dwelling because accessory dwellings have a restriction that you, they can't be larger than 900 square feet. And um, an owner has to live in one of the units. And there's also some does, some um, building orientation requirements that you can't have a door facing the street unless it was existing at the time and you're just sort of reusing space in an existing building. Um, 
So the idea is to um, allow a little more flexibility for uh, people, uh, folks in the city, and think about maybe not having um, sort of using that same platform of not requiring additional lot size for one more unit or a, a one unit attached to a single family, um, and also create allowances for different configurations. So it could be a two family meaning under one roof, or it could be two units on a parcel is still within wrapped in that sort of definition of, of two family. Um, so uh, we've done um, some editing back and forth with the consultant about um, uh, about the <coughs> draft, but we got to a point where I thought it made sense to check back in with the planning board, but in particular sort of think about those design standards that um, sort of were having difficulty um, um, coming to some conclusion about uh, in terms of how rigorous we want to be on all four sides of any kind of addition and what really uh, makes sense. Um, and um, so I wanted to have this check-in with you all and also um, sort of talk about what you think makes sense. Are some of these things going too far and are they too burdensome? Because we also want to make sure that we're not creating um, so many um, regulatory um, steps that make it a burden and, and costly for people to do this, because the idea is to allow a little bit more um, housing um, production, essentially, unit production in the city, and to allow people options who are struggling, <coughs> you know, maintaining their own single family home, or they have. Um, you know, family that they want to have live with them, but maybe they want more than 900 square feet. So there's a whole host of reasons why we want to make sure we're not on the one hand saying, hey, we want to encourage two families, and on the other hand, making it so onerous that you can't even really do it. Um, so, yeah. I have a question, and then other people might already know this, but when I read this compared to what's already in the zoning mm -hmm. for like basically single family, multifamily is a whole other thing, but is there a plan to redo the single family in a sort of form-based code way also? Because they're so different. I mean, I mean yeah. obviously it's not approved or anything yet, but it just seems like wildly different. Yeah. So we it's interesting. We've had this, we've, uh, we've been having sort of this evolution of conversation about where we want to go with zoning. We've talked for a number of years about whether we should do <coughs> A form-based code type of system throughout the city um, and so we started that conversation um, in the business districts because we already had some components particularly in downtown Northampton where we have central business architecture review anyway and there are there are some elements of um, form-based code in that so we felt it was um, an easy step to take mm -hmm. Um, we've been less certain about whether or not to then expand that to the residential districts or maybe just expand them to some residential districts but not the entire city and part of it comes to part of it stems from the idea that um, the form based code the sort of typical form based code is very prescriptive and and has um, requirements for how you define which part of the city falls into what category. And um, and I'm not sure any community necessarily can, you know, exactly um, mold itself to those um, established guidelines. But um, I think in Northampton it's particularly difficult because we, um, we have some more dense urban neighborhoods and then uh, more suburban characteristics, but not super rural. Um, and so we've been trying to introduce design um, elements into the zoning um, and then sort of test the waters, I think, for whether it makes sense to do form-based code for residential districts. Mm. 
Um, I think we've, particularly given that um, there's been concern with any new change in neighborhoods, I think we feel like design is important is an important element to look at with new development and um, that's that some of the reactions in some neighborhoods have been related to design um, some of it's just change outright but um, some of it's related to design so I think we want to um, make sure that we are being sensitive to um, concerns in the neighborhood about changes and development um, but at the same time and you know foster that um, new housing development in the neighborhood so I don't know if we would go so I guess for single-family homes that's sort of been the third rail throughout probably the country but certainly in Massachusetts about um, dictating how single-family homes look and feel and play um, it's not such a difficult leap to do two three and multifamily um, mm. uh, because single-family homes have you know since the 50s have been sort of held up on this pedestal as as um, the end all solution for housing so um, and to be protected mm -hmm. Carolyn this is referred to as character based Zoning, I think, is that just another way of referring to yeah. form base? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't, uh, I mean, my goal tonight wasn't to go through line by line and have you review it and say, yes, we're on track. I think I wanted to sort of talk more broadly about the concepts and particularly about the design elements that were, um, that have been so far recommended and it's not that we haven't had input to this we pushed back and we've sort of debated these issues already but we got to a point where um you know i wanted to highlight some examples of of housing and structures in the community and see how it matches up with this proposal and see where we are uh, <coughs> whether you think as a board this is the right way to go, whether you think that it's too far in some areas and not in others. So I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at this at all um, or, um, you know, and, and how you want to proceed. But I definitely did not intend to go sort of line by line. Um, and given that there are some folks anyway that <laughs> might not be able to stay too long, I wanted to make sure we get as, you know, much of that sort of higher level discussion and what the, the goal is to sort of get some feedback from you tonight then go back and work with the consultants and sort of <coughs> hash through some other things and then give you know come back with um, a draft that I think we really do need to sort of roll up our sleeves and go through line by line so. <coughs> um, one one thought that I had I, I quickly looked through it I certainly didn't go line by line, but mm -hmm. it struck me that there were a number of items where it was pure, a pure aesthetic judgment as to what was desirable and what was not. Um, I, the only one that comes to mind is the relative width of windows to height. Um, that couldn't be what too wide relative to the oh, so height second floor oh, windows second. need to be oh right yeah they need to be uh, equal to the lower floor or less well also there's one about it couldn't be more than twice as wide as it was high I think something I don't know it, it there were a number of things of that sort that struck me as yeah. just purely kind of arbitrary aesthetic judgments and, and I don't there were other things about requiring there be front porches you know I can understand that that has an impact on the neighbor neighborhood and the feel of the housing but others I thought if somebody wants to make really <coughs> unusual dimensions on their windows why not let them do it 
Yeah, I mean, I think sort of that's um, this. Their starting point, as um, you can probably see, is sort of looking at the context of um, <coughs> existing neighborhoods that have been there for a long time, and then some newer structures that have fit in that meet sort of the context of um, where they've been built. But um, and you sort of successful neighborhood examples as the foundation for creating these standards. The board did have, and you, I don't know if you were on the board at the time when we were looking at, so we currently we have some design requirements in urban residential A, B, and C about front porches, about um, orienting to the street. Um, and at that time, there was a discussion about how much further into design the board felt comfortable with um, supporting and recommending in terms of a, a zoning change. And there was a lot of discussion about wanting to um, make sure that the ordinances allowed for variation and new types of architectural styles or modern architecture, e even in neighborhoods that had some traditional um, um, qualities um, and historic qualities because many of the neighborhoods are sprinkled with various um, examples of uh, structures that have been built at different time periods and so there are very few neighborhoods that are completely you know out of um, you know one period in time or one decade or two decades um, and so there had been a conversation about um, wanting to allow that flexibility. So um, I think it makes sense to sort of check in to see where what you all think now. I mean, that's why I sent some of the photos to you, sort of think about that. And also a conversation about um, what seems to be sometimes sort of acceptable. It's not really, there might be, it's very simplified building structures, but no one seems to be no one seems to, um, you don't hear so much outcry about that, yet when you see something that's different and modern, that's what generates a lot of the conversation, even though there might be elements of that that actually draw from the neighborhood, whereas a simple, you know, plain box doesn't really do that so well. So I think it's just, um, I think it's important to sort of talk about what makes sense and does it make sense just from the street perspective or from, you know, 360 degrees around any kind of structure that's built, um, and what you think makes sense. Right, so we don't see the back of the independent location. I mean, it's more in the front of the street. It's more well, as you on the street. You can see on the other side. And, and <coughs> yeah, I think the. I think depending how how much you can see of the house. <laughs> Well, and is that from the perspective of the immediate neighbors who are seeing this addition, or is it from the community and the street? So I think the consultants certainly were trying to get at some of those difficult issues when there's a change in the backyard, in someone's existing backyard, and you have an extension of a house. You know, traditionally, those, um, you know, farmhouse style structures, you know, you'd had additions and it would get longer and longer and longer in the back. Um, and now sometimes when that happens, they aren't necessarily the same architecture or maybe the windows aren't, you know, are aligned differently. So I think they were trying to get at what kinds of impacts would you, would in a butter feel w with that and does it matter? Should, should we be looking at sort of that kind of math, not only massing, but, you know, design. Well, I, I tell you, and I go to Hadley. <laughs> and they have the barns that people keep on extending it yeah. three, four different times with the barn together. It's kind of awkward, right? Um, but I don't recall seeing something like this in Northampton. But, uh, well, um, I mean, the other thing that's sort of interesting about Northampton neighborhoods, or especially the ones closer into town and like ours, um, the neighborhood where I live is, it's not, I mean, backyards, I mean, we're, we're very close in our backyards too. So it isn't, it isn't, it, 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 it depends a lot. It varies, I think, from neighbor to neighbor. Like you stand in our backyard and we, I mean, it could have a real impact 
uh, you know, all the all the way around us, all, every single one of our abutters, if they did something significant. And so, so with their cons construction, because the backyards are really open and they're close, and like we don't have, at least our neighborhood, we don't have like the stockade privacy fences. Um, I mean, I can go out my backyard and see down three, four houses down um, and look to my right and I can see the back end of David's house and there's a house in between us, you know, so um, I do think that that it, it does matter some the the what, what's going on in the in the back as well. I, the, the other thing about like the windows and the front, I mean, whether or not it's held to these necessary design standards, the, the other thing that it seems to me that, that a requirement like that accomplishes is that, I mean, one of the ways to cut costs and make cheap housing that then you can rent is to, is to cut corners on things like lighting, like the house, uh, windows and, um, and it really, it, it, in, if we're trying to increase the level of good housing stock and rental stock, um, and, and lower income, we also, I think, need to be mindful that we don't create the possibility that people do things so cheaply and so, you know, that, they, that they're building accessory, you know, they're, they're building these, these uh, adding on multifamilies that, you know, don't have light and don't have, um, they're, bad, they're not good for the people living inside them, yeah. um, not just in terms of what they look like <clears throat> on the outside. I, well, I disagree with that. I think the building code covers that. You can't make bedrooms without windows. By There's other documents that cover that. And I don't think, as far as I read this, and I didn't read anything about the sides or the back of the building in this. I thought it was all front facade, unless I missed something. But um, I think it was the stuff about the, the mass, the massing. The massing, that I was sure. Saying, yeah, right. But, I mean, this seems to me to be purely about creating a front facade that has some kind of rhythm to... To fit with what I think an average, you know, 1950s Northamptonite would see as like a nice Northampton house. Um, I don't see it as anything about like the quality of life inside the house at all. Uh, that said, I'm totally against this idea of like prescribing all these. As, as a not speaking as a planning board member, as a user of of zoning, I find this incredibly arduous to to deal with. Because you're, I mean, as, I don't know if these are meant. I have a feeling these are meant more for developers who are buying book plans and trying to build something to get done, or, or homeowners. Um, but as an architect, to have to use this and the building code and deal with your client, I mean, this is a lot um, to deal with. I think it would have somewhat of a chilling effect for just for two units. I mean, it's like a lot. Um, that, that was my gut reaction. I, and that said, I mean, you can't have no, I mean, I, I understand the, the desire to have some regulation. But I, I kind of feel like the, the test should be like, what real life problem in Northampton are these meant to, f are we actually having a problem where people are building additions where the windows are 33% or something? I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen, I haven't noticed that. And I see a lot of houses around Northampton I think are weird and ugly and, but it makes Northampton interesting. I don't know. It's, it's, I, it makes the house next to it look really good. You know, I don't know. <laughs> and the fact is the people who built that probably had some reason why they wanted to. And maybe, yeah, maybe it made the numbers work so they could put that extra unit in. And uh, so I don't know. Um, the roof slope stuff, are people dying to, buy, to build like two and 12 roofs or something? Like who's, where does this come from? I, I just, I've never seen roofs out there that, that, yeah. that I said, I need to leave the city because this <laughs> roof is too shallow. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, so let's, uh, so let's start with the, the roof. So there were a couple of examples mm -hmm. that, um, well, there's one in here about sort of that you don't see um, mostly roof. I think there's mm -hmm. a, one example that some, um, they got some chatter around um, uh, over off of Prospect Street, where there's a large the yellow house, the one by the Y, yeah, one right? By the y. Yeah, that has, um, right. yeah. you know, solar uh, panels mm -hmm. on the roof, and so that one facade, you can see the roof is the primary mm -hmm. um, element that you see coming 
from right. the Everywhere. last one. It's still a great neighborhood. <laughs> right? I mean, no one's left that street because of a, a weird looking house. Yeah. There's a couple of weird looking houses on that street. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, that's the question. So, mm -hmm. you have that, and you have, and so there are some, as you saw in here, there are some restrictions that would say, no, you can't have a roof like that. So, that's my question to you, you know, that I pitched to you. Well, what about solar? You know, if we're also trying to encourage, um, and this also, um, I think would require that you're again you're solar ready for um, a structure so are, on the one hand are we saying you know your roof can only be this much space but we also want you to maximize the amount of solar gain that you have um, and um, I think but I do I do think that um, the flip side of of encouraging single families or, or allowing for single families to um, have a second unit is to make sure that um, there are some elements of design that are that um, people can understand that in their neighborhood if, that, if something's going to change they're at least going to have you know this one set of rules to that they can be assured um, Will be but but since this is really meant to, this is only for two families. Right. So you could pass this, and then someone could still do a single family home that looks like whatever they want with whatever roof, right? I mean that doesn't change that. Right. Exactly. So that's the other side of the question. And then what happens when that single family that's been added on to, then they want to convert the interior space to a second unit, but that comes down the line. Right. Um, so I think it's important to sort of think about that. So again, um, th there are also proposed changes in here that would relate to um, pre-existing sort of non-conforming structures as it relates to adding a two-family. And my concern was sort of just that, that what if someone does a big addition and then 10 years down the road, they sell the house and someone else says, oh, this is too much space for me. I want to add a second unit. Does that mean then that they couldn't use that space because it wasn't built to the, the standards? The standards. Yeah. There are so many unique houses in Northampton, too, existing, that I've seen turn into two families. Some of the stuff David was saying are kind of limiting. I don't know. I just feel like it's kind of takes the creative um, element out of professionals that are designing for their clients or a homeowner that wants to design their own stuff. So some of it I get, some of them I, you know, the window stood out to me because clearly that's what I do f most of my life is I sell <laughs> windows. So some of the stuff I was like, eh, you know, why are we telling people what their windows have to look like? Because every building has a, could have a different shape and every shape can accommodate a window that may look like horrible on my house but would look fabulous on this house that you do you know what I mean and all of a sudden you can't have it because it's twice as wide as it is high or something like that you know like, oh. no because my house came first you cannot have had fallen mm. out of my house <coughs> I mean <coughs> I, I my first job as, as an architect was doing these types of form based codes and I, I think the value of them is huge um, in a really different context. Um, like we did them for big production, like Toll Brothers, big production developers who are building like 10,000 units in Phoenix, you know, that kind of thing. <coughs> and the idea is to bring the overall level of design up to a certain point because really they want to have towns that are, look like Northampton. Um, and I know there is a sense of which, like, we should make the laws today allow us to build the town that exists today, like, like zoning and all those things have become more restrictive over time. So I'm totally in favor of pretty much with no changes, like some of the stuff about massing and breaking up the massing, I think, is generally a good idea. Um, but yeah, I think some of these prescriptive things about windows and roofs and stuff is maybe a little too much just because I don't uh, I also don't see a lot of people out there who wanting houses that don't prescribe to those things maybe. yeah it's true I, I mean know. a poorly designed new multi-family 
in in a existing neighborhood that's that will become sort of a, it, it'll be a, a new addition to add to a, a two family it seems it seems to me though i, I mean a, a poorly designed house won't sell very well i you know i mean it doesn't mean it wouldn't it doesn't mean it couldn't but it's not like you're gonna plop something terrible down so i remember the house on uh are you allowed to just specific streets or not? Am I allowed to say anything about What's that? Can I mention specific streets? I mean, we just did, right? As long as the sure. house isn't in the room, you can talk Right, okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, for instance, talk about me by my back. <laughs> well, Woodlawn is, like, really traditional. When I moved here, I was like, oh, this is such a, I live kind of near there. I was like, oh, it's like a Hansel and Gretel street. It's so cute. And then, next thing I know, Ben Cook took all these walls down, and he put this, like, contemporary thing up. And at first, I was like, oh, my God, what happened to the Hansel and Gretel street? But now you drive by, and you're like, that's awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. It's a great house. It's right. a great house. I mean, at first, I think things can be shocking. I think people, <coughs> people don't like change. We already know that. That happens at almost every meeting that we're at. People don't like change. But so somebody came up architecturally with that concept based on that street. And at first, I think it was shocking to the neighborhoods and people who didn't even live in the neighborhoods that were driving by. But now I... I mean, and I work at RK, I get a lot of compliments. People will come in and say, you know that house near the park? And I'm like, yep. Mm -hmm. I it's, like the siding on that house. What is it? I mean, it's, it's I think those like things happen. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the other thing is this one, you know, you're talking about roof pitches. That has a no, flat roof. That's mm -hmm. a flat roof. Um, flat roof, yeah. So, um, again, it's a single family, but... You know, you could easily, that could have been a two family. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, um, I mean, this is, well, this is good. Are allowed this is in this. What's that? Flat roofs are allowed in this code. It says flat roofs are allowed. It says, um, it, it yeah. says you have to something called an articulated parapet, which oh, right, right, as right. an architect, I don't know what that is, right. but right. there needs to be a definitions <laughs> uh, chapter here because a lot of these words I've never heard of before. Yeah. For, for me, the biggest piece I think that <clears throat> what I hear about is people are, some people are still opposed to this whole concept of infill. So it's not so much about what the finished house looks like, it's that some, my neighbor can put another house on that lot across the street from me. It's that it's being built at all, and that's <coughs> not going to be solved by this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that's going to be the biggest change myself, is that I we, want to appre we want to support that infill, and we want to... Um, make these lots conform to a situation that we can add another house in there. Because yeah. um, I think basically what we hear often is that we're putting in another house, that means more people on my street, that means more cars, that means more parking. It's not so much, especially with a one with a, a one family house that's going to be added, we're not going to be really talking about the massing too much like in some other projects. So, you know, I wanted to circle back at some time around the parking. For yeah. me, there's a couple of things in there that are a little confusing okay. about parking <coughs> on the house, on the side of the yeah. house, on the lot, and the open space. Yeah, but the, a, the, the way the house looks, though, which is addressed by these proposals, will soften the blow to the neighbors. I mean, sure, there will be more cars and people and whatever, but if it looks compatible or looks nice, the massing and the entrances, the porches. I think that part of it makes sense. Uh, and yeah, true. True. Um, it's true, there'll still be the people and the whatever, but. Yeah. Does the, does the current zoning make this designation between a porch and a portico? I found that confusing. No. Because it says a porch has to be this big, but right. a portico could be this, but. I didn't know right. you, you could just call it a portico. And then it no, I mean, that out. sort of, I think, gets to your previous comment about uh, who the audience is and how complex it is. And certainly from, I think, our initial perspectives, I would have to agree to, that um, I think creating a whole bunch of definitions for some things that are slightly just slightly different mm -hmm. maybe doesn't isn't necessary in Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, the language is covered front entry, and so we don't say it's a porch or a portico. We just mm -hmm. say you need to have a covered front entry facing the street. So, um, so that's obviously another question: Do we want to further define and delineate the different types mm -hmm. of those coverings and how big they can be and allocated to, or? Um, 
do you think it, it it's um, more useful to be simpler and just sort of um, and without those um, variations? And I think that goes. There's also some issues about the parking, which I think it makes sense to go back to because we certainly have a, um, traditionally there's been parking right up to side side lot lines and things like that. So yeah. Yeah, I think that should be allowed. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I find all this stuff about these side yards is like insane. I mean, <laughs> why can't I build on the side yard? I don't even understand that. As long as the water is not dripping on the. I mean. That, I don't understand why any city in the world has it, to be honest. But you know, uh, a little buffer area of the side setback, where yeah, yeah. it's crazy. I don't yeah. get it. But, I mean, um, just as a using, it's just a usability thing. Um, like this is a good example. There's a lot in a typical diagram you see in the zoning code. It's like very simple shapes, uh, and these are really cute drawings. But then like there's chimneys. Okay, but this doesn't address chimneys, so. As, it, as I've never seen this code before, I'm like, oh, something about a chimney in here. But there's not. <laughs> but there are stuff about porches, and the porches show up. So I would say these things need to be really stripped down and like only show the elements that are actually addressed in this code. Because there's a lot, a lot of people are going to be seeing this code, and there's things addressing elements that they're not used to seeing in zoning codes necessarily. Yeah. So I think that just needs to, it's like some editing down of, of okay. a lot of these diagrams. Yeah. This, this thing about the roof, this is like the, doesn't meet the standard. The only example I could think of is kind of like these, Oops. where I grew up in Maryland, and like Sorry. there's certain neighborhoods that are like just crafts, craftsman neighborhoods, and craftsman houses are the only like one story craft, or one and a half story craftsman, maybe even cape, like a salt box um, cape house. Uh, I could be, I could see as the houses that might start approaching this crazy proportion, with you know if there's a little eyebrow dormer, you know, which you typically see in a craftsman. That said, like people love those craftsman houses, and you, yeah. uh, technically, yeah, you see a lot of roof, but they look great. I don't know. Yeah. Like I couldn't imagine, maybe except that one yellow house on Prospect. <laughs> you know, what what house? You know, what what problem is this? Uh, okay. Uh, so I don't know, but, but I don't know. Every, you know, other, every situation that's. Been I guess the other before. thing too about getting too prescriptive with the design stuff is. I mean, if, if the point is also to facilitate infill, yeah, like that. and that's what we're doing, I mean, it's infill. It it's going to be so diffuse. It's not like it's going to make any meaningful. It, it's infill, you know, spread throughout already very diverse, you know, architecturally diverse in design, diverse in, in terms of design neighborhoods all through the city. I mean, I, I mean, if somebody wants to go up, if somebody wants to have all the houses look the same, they can go move up to Village Hill, or they can, you know, a new development. I mean, and those are fine, that's cute, it's what it is. I mean, just coming from Houston, where we have all those, you know, homeowners associations, and you have all the cookie cutter, you know, neighborhoods, I, that's, who, nobody wants that. I mean, that's, that's the context at which that, this kind of, that, right. you know, you suggested, not, but I don't, it, it just, it also seems like it was, wouldn't even matter here, because, most of this is going to go into already existing neighborhoods that are kind of wacky and off the wall. And does this not apply to anything under cluster development, right? <coughs> the things that are right. It's really this so far is a sort of um, you know a carve out. It's just for a, a second mm -hmm. unit on existing a house that, that wants to make an assessment. Or if there's a or, lot, or if there's a lot, a two family, a two unit, yeah. Yeah. And what we're proposing, if somebody wants to add a second house on their lot with an existing one family, that it's a site plan approval every time they have to come here in front of the board. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which we give feedback anyway when people so, come and they throw their plans up and you look at right. them and you go, ooh, do you think maybe you could do a little this and that? And right. We've had people. But yeah, but we've done we've free design advice. We've, <laughs> we, we've massaged a couple of the plans. We're like, mm, can you do this instead of that? Yeah, somebody comes. And then they do, and then the other ones come. They know what more? Which, which probably an architect or a builder doesn't want to jump through those hoops. They, the reality they, is no. The reality is we know what those questions are going to be, and you design it two steps back, so you know. Okay, the planning board is going to ask for that, so we're designed it to give it to them when <laughs> they ask for it. Mm -hmm. You know, most architects that, or d developers have been through this before, and it's the same questions you get at most of these. 
The other piece, too, is to have enough um, to s allow some subset of these to be by right, so they don't have to come to the board. Yeah. But right now, we're still we're looking at, I think, detached as still requiring a planning board site plan. Right now, detached accessory dwelling units go to the zoning board for special permit. So having it come to the planning board for site plan is a little bit less of a um, threshold to meet than a special permit for the zoning board. But um, we don't, see, we still don't see a lot of those, you know, in any given year. Can you go up to the thing where it shows the different, you can have one on top of the other and the oh, yeah. two next to each other. So, Oh, this was another diagram I thought was like overly complicated for like all these bumps in the house. It's like a very specific house that it's showing, you know? Yeah. I don't, let me just see if I can. Yeah, I think it's, you keep going. Yeah. Okay, go. so these, yeah. So, so this, front and back, side by side, right. one on top, yeah. So this made me think like if I was a developer and I own, and, or developer suddenly, say I'm a homeowner building a house, I'm not a developer. <laughs> I'm a good homeowner, not an evil developer, and I own, and I happen to have two lots. If you, you could build two houses next to each other, what I would call a townhouse. You could build two townhouses next to each other, right? That's what this would be. Mm -hmm. On yeah. one lot. Yeah. But if I had two lots next to each other, I couldn't but build four townhouses in a row. Like attached. Four you townhouses. Could. Yeah. Could you do that? I couldn't understand from this code whether that yeah, was allowed or Yeah, so not. That, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Because there's stuff about side yards. So this is totally pulled out of context in that this is just for adding a second unit. And this would apply everywhere in the city, including in the more suburban neighborhoods, you know, Florence Road, Ryan Road, um, um, and further. And, and, beyond. Yeah. and beyond. And beyond, and beyond. But we also have allowances for cluster, we have allowance for three, four family and more in the URC and URB district. So we do allow townhouses on, you know, four units attached in the URB district or the URC so, district. So say you were just doing two. Yeah. But you're saying if you're adding, you're at, let's say I buy a house and it's falling apart and it's a scrape. So I'm going to. I'm like, I'm going to scrape it, but I'm going to build two units. I'll build this, this bottom diagram. Uh -huh. That would be by right allowed yeah. by, as it is now? Or, or as this is constant? So depending on the zoning, yes. In URB, say. I, in URB, a two family is allowed by right, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the only thing that would trigger planning board review is if the total new construction is over 2,000 square feet, then anywhere in the city, any new construction over 2,000 square feet gets kicked to the planning board for site plan review. So if your two family was 2,500 square feet total, then you'd be coming to the planning board. Uh, so it's well, everyone. The use is allowed, right? But it still right. has to be dimensional. Exactly. And, yeah. Right. Wait, so <coughs> the use is allowed. However, why are they at planning board if it's, if it's 2,500 square? But every house is every two two families is going to be over 2,500 every time. Well, not necessarily. I mean, we're encourage, we're trying to encourage smaller units. So there are there may be a situation where you have you know smaller <coughs> two units. Um, but the reason is that, and this has been in the ordinance for a long time, is that um, once you so there's a considered intermediate project is two thousand square feet or more construction, up to five thousand square feet. Anything over five thousand square feet of new floor area is a major project. So Anything you know in that 2,000 to 5,000 square feet is coming to the planning board. The use for a two-family is allowed, but the board looks at access, landscaping, orientation, site layout, some of which now will be defined potentially prescriptively in the zoning anyway, so it will limit the, the total items that, this, that the board might be reviewing in a site plan for because um, it would follow this right zone base. so it basically I mean think of it as um, now in the zoning for for um, special permit you have very specific criteria in the URB and URC district for more building more than seven units so there's this long list of um, criteria that an applicant has to meet 
the board still has to approve it, but everyone going into it knows that you know they have to hit all of those things. So this is, in a way, creating some of those same um, requirements, but for two units. Um, and if something came to the planning board, you would sort of look down and say, okay, you're meeting this one, this one, this one. So, but the difference isn't really like, you're still following the same requirements. The difference is the public gets to come and comment on it. Yeah. That's the difference. Right. And it may be through this process, maybe in the B and C district, we say, even if you're 2,000 square feet, when, once we do this form-based code for two family, don't come to the planning board. I mean, it could be that too. We haven't really, we haven't, right. you know, thought about that. This piece. is so prescriptive. It's hard to imagine that if you're following all these rules, right. like what else is the planning board going to look at? Exactly. So that's another thing that we want to we want to evaluate because again, we're trying to encourage housing in town because we know we need new housing of all types. And so, if we know we want it and we have the criteria, then why make a burden of someone coming to the planning board when you've got all the requirements listed in the code? Is there any reason why it couldn't just as easily apply to three family? I mean, why stop at two? Um, well, that's sort of the next step, actually. You jump in the gun. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm this sorry. Is, this is really, I mean, the reason why we started this is because the goal is allow two families everywhere in the city where currently we'd only allow a single family home, like in your neighborhood in Leeds, only single family homes are allowed unless someone's doing a four acre cluster development. So in your neighborhood, using this, you could add a second unit to your property and it wouldn't be restricted or confined to an accessory dwelling size and have that ownership requirement that we have under an accessory dwelling. So that's why this doesn't say three and four family, because this is meant to cover the entire right. city. Carol, there's another little <laughs> piece in here about uh, using open space. Uh -huh. So I wonder if that's going to be kind of restricted, too, because some of the in-town lots are so small yeah. that people you won't be able to put a lot. Because even if they meet the size setbacks, they still aren't going to have this space that um, allowable for passive or active recreation. Yeah. It's a um, tiny bit of space. It's only 150 square feet. They should be able to meet that given that we already have a minimum open space anyway for lots. So in the uh, urban residential C, we have a requirement of 30% of the parcel being open, which means it can't be driveway or building. So that some of that 30% would go towards meeting that minimum sort of usable open space there. So, some of those numbers were kind of cut off in the one you sent us, <coughs> yeah. okay. I think. And I wasn't sure. Was the idea is basically it's the same rules apply as previously. Mm -hmm. so is, that, is that the general five. idea? Is that it's page like five. in URB, it's a, whatever, 40%? Right the top there, what are those column headings? Is that URC and URB, 30 and 40? Yeah, it's sort of confusing what that's all about. Yeah, it must be C and B. <coughs> um, it got, it maybe didn't come down for the next page. Is that what happened? Um, and yeah. these seem to be the same percentages that are already in the. Yeah. Existing. Yeah, we're not, there were no, uh, to my recollection, we were not proposing to change those percentages okay. from the existing conditions. Um, that seems to be the question, though. Like, if we want to allow more density, let's allow more density. Uh, I mean, the idea is now is you could do a huge single-family house. All we're saying now is you can cut that huge house and have two people live, two different families living in it. I guess it's a different right. number of cars, right? Potentially. Right, but I mean, in a sense. <laughs> so. Um, we did modify the percentage of open space in 2013, not in the URC. It's been 30% for years and years. In the B, it went from 50% to 40% for that very reason. Right. Okay. Um, and A as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. If you have a big house, that, say you have a 5,000 square foot house shaped like a barn with no massing brakes or anything, and I want to chop, I want to interior renovate it into two family. Is that what you're saying is like the sort of 
thing it's not figured out yet like how that right so because you're not going to like go and create a niche to break up the massing in an existing barn shaped house right can you sell my right. white whale house that i sent you well no i mean i can um you have another one there no that's that's one of the ones the house right? over on finn yeah, yeah. That's what right in my backyard. I thought that was a single, fa that's a single family, right? Uh, it looks like a I don't know. What it is. The one that they're... It's a single family. But the point is, I think it's 8,000 square feet. So it certainly could be, could accommodate <laughs> more than... <coughs> Do you have any idea on, what Finn? that is? I mean, Shakers why? About 50 people in there. Is it really <laughs> one family with an 8,000... Is that the new one that they're building? Yeah, it's not a new one Right on that's Finn Street. Family? Yeah. I don't know. Um, what that one that's like right at the end of uh, what State, State Street, Street and yeah. and yeah, yeah. take that's, a left. That's a single State. family house. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Holy, jeez! Yeah. Um, it's just got one electric meter. Shoo way! Yeah, that's a big Crazy. house. Well, well you know what? I we lived on Union Street. Uh, they they took that. Um, <clears throat> There's a big house next to the old jail, and they, the big house. Yeah, the San, the, <laughs> right, the big house. <laughs> uh, no, the jail's never the big house. Uh, I know what's what from the big house. Um, anyway, it just made me think that that, that place was quite used, and it was like that. That it was like the oh, long, and then it had the right carriage store. house. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Uh, and that's a single family too. And that that was a single family, but they also had like a carriage house on the right. side. Yeah. Um, right. So. You know, that's an example of, so that's sort of that other question. What if you happen to have this big, and so let's say in five years they move and someone else buys that, but they can't, they want to take that 8,000 square feet and create more than mm -hmm. a single family. As anybody in their right mind would want to do. So how do you, you know, are these require? is it important to make sure that these requirements like don't restrict that from happening? Because I think the other piece of this is sort of sprinkled throughout this and the policy of the city has been, through these zoning changes since 2007, has been let's make it as flexible as possible for people because of changing circumstances. You know, if a structure can accommodate more than one unit, why not? If, you know, you can accommodate on the, especially that location in town. So I want I so part of the question was, um, you know, a does it make sense to you that you know we don't necessarily get into the nitty gritty of conversions of existing structures because I think that would make it it's another layer of com, you know complication and complexity, um, and does that sort of is that counter to what we've been trying to do? But that goes, so that's kind of, that's kind of why I wrote up my initial question is what's the thought to do with it single family because if this is saying it's not about that there's two families the problem is that there's masses that are too big yeah right but, so the, but that's not the criteria by which right I don't so know what the criteria that has been previously but um, there has been no to criteria. Me, I don't think that White House is too big I mean it's a big house but I don't know it's, oh, it's horrendous <laughs> but, but like <laughs> you know but it's such an arbitrary decision uh, like uh, such a uh, subjective opinion it's uh, well. Hey, yes, it's most it's things are. Subjective. I mean, it's subjective. I mean, maybe once the art, once the landscaping goes in, oh, it's, maybe it'll soften maybe up. It'll right now, scale. it's just dirt and white. Yeah, well, and, and the problem is, it white. just dwarfs everything close to it. It's a monster yeah. on the on the streetscape. Okay. Just like has anyone seen the. Um, on Gothic Street, we approved the. Yeah, it's three stories. Uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, oh, it's horrendous. It's I think, just I think what, we're what we're wrestling with is that the whole point of this is to allow neighborhoods to change over time, and inevitably something this idea oh it doesn't fit with the neighborhood. The whole point is to allow neighborhoods to develop things that don't quite fit because over time those neighborhoods change. None of these houses in almost any of Northampton would be there if they only built things that fit with the little wood shacks that existed in 1650. I mean, yeah, you always yeah. build things that don't fit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, I, I think there are, I mean, I'm certainly not in favor of enforcing particular restrictions on design elements, but to say that something should roughly fit into a neighborhood in terms of 
massing and scale and, and uh, setback. Let them design it any way they want, but give some validity or nod to the neighborhood context. I mean, like that white one to me looks like a monstrosity that was dropped on the neighborhood. And the same thing with the Melnick place on Gothic Street. It just dwarfs the adjacent structure, structures. I think there's an argument that could be made that there doesn't necessarily dwarf, neither of these dwarf the other structures. They're si very similar heights. I think it's the, um, for the, the Fence Street one, <coughs> it's a, you know, 87 foot long massing that's not, you know, articulated in the way that other structures in that neighborhood are articulated, but the heights are uh, the same, basically. So I don't know that, uh, um, I think you could argue that the that that there's not a dwarfing there, and same with Gothic Street. I think it's where it's presented on the site, as opposed to a height that's out of character yep. of well, other structures. Yeah. So there probably are things that you could massage about those elements, but um, I and, and I think they argued that in the in the planning board meeting for not this one because it didn't come through, but the Gothic Street. <coughs> Um, you know, you reviewed the design and 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 had some say in that. But the, fin, the Finn Street didn't come to the planning board. No, because it's single family home. So even of no size comes to planning board. Right, because that's because single family homes can do whatever they want in Massachusetts, basically. Right. Well, and it's URC, right? So okay. it a few porticos would help these states. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't. We'll have covered front entries because that's Kingston. the requirement. Yeah. 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 And the, the, the Gothic Street, I mean, this is already approved, obviously, but the fact that it's, the height is the same, okay. I think it's deceptive because a flat roof going up to that height occupies vastly greater mass and size than a, a peaked roof. Yes. The roof ends at the same point, but they present totally differently. But Gothic Street is a great example. That's like right downtown. Yeah, I was about to say that that's exactly where we should be growing density. We should have, the fact is, that's not too big. All the buildings around it are too small. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's creating the affordable housing problem. Um, yeah, you know? The, yeah, uh, it, it's, um, I mean, if you well, compare, that, if you go two parcels away, you have that whole string of, well, I forget the address. The, the, the office, yeah, right. the right. building. They're right. the same height and, and massing. They have a little bit, they have different way of breaking up the massing. Oh, a hugely but. different presentation, though. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like the, the so Gothic, the, the, the one on Gothic Street, that, that it's, it, it has the effect of, of, of ever so slightly expanding the footprint of downtown. And down, you know, the downtown aesthetic is taller. It's denser. It's, you know, so like... I, I think we'll get used to it. <laughs> but I think it probably does contrast, like immediately across the street, there are a couple of single family homes, but I think that speaks to your comment that, you know, that's, that is downtown, so maybe the norm shouldn't be single family homes or won't be for the long term, right. as opposed to, you know, um, allowing the flexibility for them not to be single family homes, I mm -hmm. should say, as opposed to saying, you know, they shouldn't, so that, allowing that sort of mix that close in mm -hmm. is important. Um, well, and the other thing too, that the, those single family homes that are right in, in there and down that street on, is that increasing what's happening is those houses are being bought up like the Melnick's first house um, and they're either mixed use or they're using them as office space. The thing is that it keeps going, you know, you're gonna see more business people who are, you know, want to be downtown and they're going to build new structures. They're going to take, you know, they're going to take those buildings down and cause a house doesn't work very well for <clears throat> the needs of, of many, you know, professional things. So I, I think, I think it's just going to be part of a, a, of a appropriate, I think a good, a desirable expansion of the, what constitutes the downtown. The, of the, and the corner is floor is commercial <coughs> residential on the top. Right. So it's a wedding there. I mean, I, I think I look at the, the box, but they have to do all the finishing and I think to look like more the neighborhood. But um, I think it was a good thing to do, really. Um, okay, so what I think I'm hearing is simplification, 
um, um, and particularly around specific elements like the roof and windows, window pattern. Porticos. Um, right, porticos. Um, and not so much, um, uh, we didn't quite get to parking, except there was some discussion about parking up to the side. Can you explain uh, what's meant by this parking calculation? I was completely confused as to what it was trying to mandate. Um, <coughs> certainly restricting the total <coughs> spaces right up to the side lot line, but also in front of the structure. Um, Though that part I understood, but it was later on where it was like the minimum parking requirements. It's kind of like one per unit up to a thousand square feet. Yeah, so that's our current standard is one parking space per unit um, per um, thousand square feet up to a maximum of two per unit is what the standard is now except for <coughs> the, um, Well, it, you don't, it didn't really mean maximum. That confused me too. Does that mean you couldn't have more parking? No, it only has minimums. It's the maximum required. So oh, we, the so city wouldn't require you to have right. more. Mm. Um, if you had a bigger structure, so I'm just trying to. I think it's at the very end. Yeah. Okay. Um, so parking must be located to the side or rear of a dwelling. No more than one parking space can be located in front of the dwelling's front facade. So the location stuff made, I think, a fair amount of sense. Okay. I was trying to imagine these houses with like six and eight parking spaces. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. who ha I mean, it, it's sort of counterintuitive. The place where you really want to add density is downtown, the general URCB areas. A. I mean, some of these SR, other places where this is going to apply, I can't imagine <laughs> why you would be doing this, really. I guess you could build something more than 900 for your mother-in-law or something, I guess, is yeah. the idea. Yeah. And, and those are the only zones I can imagine where people would have space to do six and eight parking spaces, I suppose. Yeah. So. And then the other thing that's sort of new is even beyond the setback. So there's this whole issue about a build-to zone. So you have this um, area where the building would, would be allowed you know, between the setback and sort of a maximum setback almost. Mm -hmm. But parking shouldn't be in that area either, whether or not it was in the front setback. So right now we only allow um, two vehicles in the front setback, but our setbacks are pretty small in the in-town districts, um, 10, 10 feet for front setback. So you can really only fit, uh, you can't even really fit one car in that front setback anyway. Um, if if um, the structures pulled that part forward. And the reason behind this again is <clears throat> really around aesthetics that the front yard just doesn't look like a parking lot. Right. There's really some right. lawn there. There's mm -hmm. some. Right. And there's transition space, you know, between <clears throat> sidewalk and the front portico porch uh -huh. covered <laughs> entry. Um, and that that's really sort of, that's a living space. It's not a parking space. These should be the rules for King Street. <laughs> um, no, but if you keep going down just to the, where the numbers part, there's a little chart, I think, at the end. Yeah, this part. Okay. So you're saying this means one per thousand square feet up to one per unit? Up to a maximum. Oh, I think that's supposed to be a maximum of one per unit required. So if you had... So it's one unit required. It's one it's space. It's one per it's unit. It's one per unit required. Yes. That would be a simpler way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just, I couldn't tell if that was meaning something else or not. Uh, but I, I think, think later on when you have URA, it's a little different. Right. <laughs> and um, I think that could be simplified for sure. I think that was to mirror sort of how it is now. We say uh -huh. up to a maximum of two per unit. We never require more than two per right. unit. And so this is saying, well, let's drop that down because, you know, right. we're competing for two things when we still have two cars per unit in the downtown area, right? We want units, but then sometimes parking gets in the way. Is there any further discussion about not requiring parking in downtown? We don't require parking in the central business district for new units, but we haven't um, 
reach that. Um, we haven't had that discussion for the residential districts. Yeah. So that makes sense to simplify that. Um, is there anything else that's, that that you want to make sure that gets addressed at this stage? I mean, again, this is a, you know, this is the first draft that you've seen, so it's not going to, it, it will come back to you. But I really just sort of wanted to gauge where you guys were with this, you know, touch base, and then be able to sort of continue to work. We want to move this along now, um, sort of then. We've had a lot of other projects going on, and this hasn't really. So these diagrams um, <clears throat> that I think you mentioned earlier, which which are really helpful in understanding the setbacks, and whatnot, but I'm not quite sure if the lay I'm not sure what these layouts are. If these are buildings, the second building on here, the shadowed areas. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think there may be. I, I like that there's a consistency. We're using the same diagram throughout this, yeah. but I'm not sure that that's the right diagram of houses. Okay. A very weird kind of setup. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll definitely go through. Oh, like they're all the, like page five. Oh. It's this book we want to talk about the lots really and the lot standards. Um, it's the same diagram used throughout the. Uh -huh. Thanks. I don't know, just from a usability point of view, not, not specific um, comment, but as long as you're having a consultant write this, like have the consultant write it so it fits very seamlessly with how the existing zoning is written, because I find that very confusing when you're like, that pushes you over to this chapter, and it's like the whole structure is totally different. Yeah. Like URA, URB, URC should always be in the same order, because I think they flip it, like put the higher density ones first. But if I'm reading the zoning, I'm okay. like, oh, I forgot which was C and which was A and it's just that sort of consistency throughout because <clears throat> we in this room know it's a document that's being written now but someone coming in later is not it's it's all one big couple hundred pages to read all at once. Okay. I love the addition of just the, uh, the house photos you know I think that adds mm -hmm. it, it helps a, a fellow like me understand what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, this is very helpful. So I appreciate it and to be continued for sure. Cool. I, I think that, you know, do we open it? It was a public hearing. So it was really meant for. What is the process on this then? I mean, it's been going on for a while. This conversation about the form-based zoning. But at some point, does it go to the city council? Does the Yeah, so it would be a code change. So any co um, or amendment goes officially is adopted by city council, but that process requires official public hearing to be yeah. held by the planning board, official mm -hmm. public hearing to be held by city council. Potentially, in this case, we might do a joint public hearing with city council um, committee um, just to make sure everybody sort of um, sometimes it's helpful for counselors to hear plenty of board member comments and vice versa. So um, we might try to do that jointly. But at any, way, at any rate, both those committees need to hold a public hearing. It could be joint. And then it, as a recommendation goes back to full council, and then council um, determines whether or not to adopt. Certainly all the uh, architects and building contractors in the town have probably they have a way of weighing in on this or hearing about these changes coming up. I wonder if they have, yeah, the only place where they can really weigh in is at those public hearings. Well, so as part of this, actually, the consultants did have um, a um, sort of focus group with architects and uh -huh. designers to, to bounce some of these ideas off and get feedback. So that, that was um, with the intention, obviously, of understanding what the um, development community, <coughs> community feels about um, these changes. So um, that was that was one element. Um, there were the, think. there were the public the, the big group sessions like in Florence and downtown right. by Dodson and Flake, but that was more about the city sidewalk design. That was about yeah. form-based code for Florence Center and right. downtown. Um, 
And then Dodson Flinker's doing this piece just for the two families. Two families. So, okay. right, we haven't done, um, we'll need to do more outreach once we, you know, hone this down a little bit. Yeah. The, the, the golf course thing that we looked at, mm -hmm. would those be, in five years, some, could those people build second units on those homes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's only cluster developments which wouldn't be cut allowed. Uh, well, it sort of depends. It depends on the nature of the permit, or it might require an amendment to a permit. So it doesn't mean that they would be not necessarily allowed at all. It would might just mean a different permit path to to get new units. But this is, I mean, a cluster development, if it comes in as a cluster, it means a development of maybe multiple lots, maybe mm -hmm. multiple units on those lots. Um, if we make two family by right in every district, then each of those individual lots that are approved under a cluster could have a second unit. So it okay, could that, be. That was my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So it does apply to them. Okay. Right. So I was thinking more of. That we have a separate permit process for cluster. <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it, it would essentially this would allow that because we. But once the clusters are approved, those are just regular lots. After exactly. That. So if they're on their own lot, so it's just like accessory <coughs> dwelling units. Now, if you have a single family home, you're allowed anywhere to do an accessory dwelling, on your single family home. Mm -hmm. So this would replace that. I think it's great. I mean, thinking about a place like Village Hill, which like we went through, ten or fifteen, however many years, getting right. to this point. But what's great is because it allows it to give it the opportunity to change over time and not just be stuck in whatever you thought in 2005 or 10 forever. Except for those pesky owners association agreements. Oh, they have <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I feel like we're, we're going to come back in 50 years and Village Hill is going to look like Village Hill. <laughs> Which is fine. It's charming. Yeah. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yep. Uh, yes. First. Tool. Second. Great, okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Anything big coming up in our next meeting, which will be the 